it was, it just restored me, it saved me. And I, mean, I thank God for it. And then the Palestinian Christians, um, they introduced me to Jesus. I remember I walked as a wonderful group in, in, in Jerusalem called Sabil, it means the way in Arabic. And they are uh, all about resistance. And they, you know, I got there and we, we talked and, and I said, well, how do you deal with this? You know, you, you're a dispossessed Jerusalemite. You know, my uncle and aunt and my family is living in the, ha in the houses that we took away from you in 1948. You know, your kids are leaving because there's no future for them. They're like, oh, you're being ripped off. They hate you. They love my people. How do you deal with it? And she, I'll never forget what she said. She said, we follow Jesus. Who was he? He was a Palestinian Jew who lived under Roman occupation. And he preached to his people about how they could maintain their identity and their devotion to God and to Torah by resisting tyranny. Don't buy into the Roman thing. Do not worship the emperor. Don't let them tax you to death. Uh, I mean, that's the context of Jesus' ministry. And that, boy, did that speak to me. I said, oh, I understand why I love you guys so much. I was brought up on this. I was brought up on the prophets. Jesus seems to me like the best prophet and the best Jew <laughs> speaking truth to power to the institution of his time, the temple, the priests. And the... So it all made sense. Short, long answer to a short question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about the peace movement in Israel and what are, it's, you have to look for information about that, news about that. What are some reliable media sources to get information about the peace movement in Israel? And, and just in general, in terms of the media, you know, things have changed over the past almost 20 years that I've been doing this. You can read about it in the New York Times now. You can read about it in the Washington Post now. Um, the bloom is off the rose, and you can you can you, you can you can read about the Palestinians. You can read about apartheid. Um, so you can see it in the mainstream media. I mean, not not everywhere, not in the small town papers, but in the in the Los Angeles Times and the Chicago Sun and Washington Post and maybe the Boston Globe, and um, you can read about it. The peace movement in Israel. OK, that's a whole other story. You know, there's a joke, which is that there are 50 peace organizations in Israel on the, on the left, right? It's the same 50 people. <laughs> there's a very sad truth to that. Uh, they really are marginalized. Um, it used to be that there was, a, I mean, Israel was founded by socialists from Russia and from the Soviet Union. They were atheists and they were radical socialists and they, they started the kibbutzim, which were, you know, radical experiments in, in socialism. It was great. And they, and they basically put together what, what was supposed to be a really good, fairly labor-oriented, left-wing social democracy. Well, you can't do that and be involved in a colonial ethnic cleansing operation at the same time. And that's the contradiction that has finally come back to bite Israel. And it was inevitable. Mm -hmm. So, but if you're a kid raised in Israel, you were raised um, as a super nationalist, racist, um, ideologue who believes that, the, that you got to serve in the army, the army saves us from all those horrible Arabs that are trying to kill us, the world hates us. It's a very toxic uh, way to be raised. And so there aren't that, and the left has, there's no left left in Israel, right? The so-called moderates, I mean, the center has moved so far to the right. Um, the Labor Party is gone. The right-wing parties, even Likud, is now in bed with the religious racist parties on the right to them. 
And that's getting a lot of press now. And people are thinking, what the hell is going on with Israel? How can we support it? So I think in some ways you sit back and watch this thing unravel because it will and it has to. If you want to connect with, um, with uh, good sources, just take my email address and I'll, I'll send you. Or, or, or just go to um, palestineportal.org. P-A-L-I-N-Palestineportal.org. Um, and uh, and yes, and hopefully I'll be having something come out in Mondo Weiss next week. Let's go to mondoweiss.net. M-O-N-D-O-W-E-I-S-S dot net. You'll find everything you need. Then also go to, what's the... Um, What's the address for the UCC PIN, Catherine? That's it, uccpin.org. Is that it? Yeah. United Church of Christ, Palestine, Israel Network, uccpin.org. You've got your own UCC uh, organization, and they put out wonderful stuff, and they'll send you a monthly newsletter that'll knock your socks off. So you start with all that. On the way uh, that comes out monthly from the conference, I put in the uccpin.org uh, monthly newsletter, which is packed with wonderful information. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out there. You will be careful because your email box just got crowded. <laughs> right. the, there's also books uh, by Mark. Uh, he has this one, A Wall in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and this one, Fatal Embrace. Are they, they are both by you, okay. Um, and he will, uh, he's selling them, or he can talk about that. And then he brought several of these uh, that can be used for a study. Uh, they're free. Kairos document. Please, please take it. We wrote it about 11 years ago. From the Christians in Yeah, well, this is, well, in 2009, the Palestinian Christians came out with an amazing document. And um, so this is a response to that, and it's for American Christians in particular. It makes great reading, and it's a study guide, uh, so take one. Don't touch. My question's not fully formed, so bear with me. <laughs> um, I... I really appreciate, and I, I watched some of your videos online, so thank you whoever, Catherine probably put a um, little, uh, shared some information with us ahead of time about who you are and the work that you do. And I really appreciated, um, you know, you talking about the trauma related to anti-Semitism and that being, not to conflate it with the apartheid state that's happening in, in Palestine and um, the oppression that's happening there. You know, I'm, I'm wondering for myself as someone who has a lot of close friends who are Jewish, um, how to attend to both of those things. So to attend to the trauma and the hurt um, that continues to this day. It's not, hist it's not just historical. Like, we see the rise in anti-Semitism, right, in the United States and around the world. Um, that's happening. And to hold true to the atrocities that are happening in Palestine. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to that. It's, it's, a, it's a tough question. Have you had, I'm sorry, you introduced yourself to me before, yeah, but I forgot. Beth. Beth. Mm -hmm. Have you had any of those conversations yet, Beth? And how have they gone? It depends on the person. Sure. Yeah. Some, some, are, more, some are more open and some are not. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, I've, come pe I've had people come up to me in tears and say, you know, I learned about Palestine and then I uh, had a conversation with my, my best friend from college and the whole relationship blew up and she won't talk to me again. I mean, it's very painful. And then I've had, I've had clergy, I've had pastors come up to me and say, look, you know, I've got this relationship with the synagogue and the rabbi down the street and this is a precious relationship and it is. But and I, I approach this, and then this black cloud, and the message I get is, you back off from that. 
that may be beginning to change, but very, very slowly, the Jewish, I mean, especially for clergy on both sides, I really feel for them because it's a precious relationship. And it's not their fault that this is blown up and, and, and that the Jews have made this, the institutional Jews have made this rule that, you know, we'll be your friends, maybe we'll forgive you, <laughs> but stay away from this. And it's very strong, it's very powerful, and it's very painful for me to see it because it's very self-destructive. And I mean, I had a friend, a Presbyterian pastor, early on in this work back in Washington, and he had me come to his church. I write about it in the book. And I gave a talk, and he came up to me afterwards. He said, thank you very much. I really agree with you. And I was really strong, you know, in the talk. He said, but I, I, he said, I, I think I need to tell you that we need to, I feel like we need to be careful in talking to our Jewish colleagues about this. And I said, really? Tell me more. Because uh, I was naive at that point. And he said, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a Presbyterian pastor, and I am a historian and a student of church history. And um, I feel personally responsible for the genocide of the Jews at the hands of the Nazis. And he said, and, you know, I'm very involved in interfaith work. I meet with a group of, you know, imams and priests and Jews and, and, and rabbis and, and, and ministers every month, and we are committed to talking about social justice, but we leave the issue of Israel and Palestine off the table out of respect for the rabbis, he said. <laughs> And I said to him, I mean, this again, this is like sort of hit me. I, I said, I, I think you need to do something else with your Christian guilt. This is not what Jesus wants you to do. He said, you're not being friends to the Jewish people and letting us get away with this. And he, you know, we had a, we had a, a lot of conversations about that, but he would not step off his position. He would not step off his position. So I, really, I think I realized in that moment what it was I was here to do. It's to talk to Christians and say, please be, you know, I understand that you're going to be hit with the worst name you can be called. And I can't tell you what to do, but I think it's a cross to pick up. I mean, uh, it's not about loving the Jewish people. If you, if it's about loving Jesus. It's about loving justice. But if you want to make it about loving the Jews then love us the way you would love your, you know, alcoholic, drug-addicted kid who's asking for more money and for the keys to the car. You know, that's the kind of love that we need. Um, and it's tough love, and it's hard. Now, I'm not saying that's a situation with you and your friends, but one thing that, two things, to get around to answering your question. One is, I have learned that in conversations, whether it's with fellow Jews or with uh, other folks, um, that when I start to feel like it's not a conversation, that I just stop. If there's openness to having a conversation, then maybe you're starting with acknowledging the pain on the other side, which I think is a great place to start, and, and, and leave it at that. And then I always come back to the point that you made about the fact that it's important to make sure that this, this, a lot of these people are confused about Israel being the same as Jewish. They say they're, they're not the same. And um, it's, it was part of the whole Zionist program, which, by the way, is a colonial criminal program. You don't have to use those words. It's part of the Zionist program to make sure that people confuse that. They didn't name it Israel by accident. That was really smart of Ben-Gurion. He wanted people to confuse that. Zionists and the defenders of Israel want people to continue to conflate the two absolutely so that it's anti-Semitic to speak up about Israel. And they're still using it. And they pulled out the big guns about that. So to me, that's a good sign. To me, it means that the battle is joined, and we get to talk about it now. So, uh, w you know, thank you for having those conversations with your friends, and you just have to go with your heart and with your judgment about it. Yeah.
Speaking about politics, what about the U.S. government's activities? Well, I was just about to say that in answering Beth's question. <clears throat> I mean, as Americans, we are like up, up to here in complicity. I mean, um, there's a wonderful book uh, written by a guy named Rashid Khalidi, who is a uh, professor of, um, of Middle East Studies or something at Columbia. He wrote a book about, I don't know, five or six years ago, 10 years ago, called Brokers of Deceit. And basically, it's about, it makes a very clear point. He said, it, what he writes about is that this business about the United States being an honest broker between Israel and the Palestinians and being in favor of there being in a Palestinian state living side by side in peace and security with Israel. Can I say this in church? Yeah. It's bullshit. It's a lie. Actually, who was it who said there are lies and there are damn lies? It was Mark Twain. That's a damn lie. Will, Will Rogers? Oh. Or maybe it was Will Rogers. It's a damn lie. <clears throat> That's all Diplo speak. Both Israel and the United States have never, ever intended for there to be any power, independence, sovereignty, or liberation given to the Palestinian people. It's always about helping Israel take it all. That's the truth. And that's still, I mean, that's still our policy. And it doesn't matter who's in the White House. You know, even Obama, he learned real quick what the rules of the game were, real quick after that first speech in Cairo. Um, <clears throat> so I think two things. One is, again, uh, we have to sit back and watch Israel destroy itself, which it's doing. Until, and working real hard at it, and I think, I say, that's great, bring it on. Let's see, the, we now see the true face of Israel. You know, Yitzhak Rabin, the, the Nobel Prize winner, the man of peace, I mean, he, he said, break the bones of the Palestinians when they started the, the first intifada, okay? And he built more settlements than Ariel, Ariel Sharon. So that's what you do if you're Israel. Um, and again, I think that our comfort zone as a country that looks like still is struggling to get out from being basically run by rich white guys, right? is very much at home with the idea of a white European colonial project <clears throat> to take land away from brown people, right? I mean, we know what that's about, and that's cool. Now you're starting to get some, some people in, in the halls of Congress who are speaking up. That's beginning. So <clears throat> we do need to do a lot of advocacy. We need to work on our elected representatives you know, we've got two senators who right now are hopeless, but we're going to keep banging on their doors. We've got one representative, what's the guy's name with the bow tie? Uh, yeah. Who, you know, but, you know, I'm, I'm in the first district with, with uh, um, yeah. And she, I've spoken with her. She's married to a Jew and goes to synagogue. And she listens, but she won't. She won't. Which one is that? Um, Suzanne Bonamici. Yeah, Suzanne Bonamici. Mark, Senator Merkley listens. He knows about it. He's been there. He's seen it. But he does nothing about it. He, Mer Merkley, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's not any different than Wyden on Israel. And, and, he's, and he's not going to spend any political capital on Israel. That's the problem right there. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm one degree of separation from Jeff Merkley. I've met with him, and I have a friend who... He was in um, Young Life. He, he was one of his counselors in Young Life. So that's where Merkley comes from, Young Life. Wow, yeah. oh, wow. that's interesting. And I, I think I can speak to Young Life people. Yes. I mean, you just talk about Jesus, right? <laughs> but he's a senator. So I think nothing's going to shift until the political wind shifts, until it's no longer politically advantageous for us to be supporting Israel. And that could shift. Things could change regionally over there. They could. I think in the meantime, all we can do is to continue to advocate and bang on the doors and raise our voices and support BDS, 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 BDS. Nonviolent boycott, divestment, and sanctions. 
Now, it's not going to bring Israel to its knees economically, but people will say, why are we boycotting Israel? What is it about Sabra Hamas? What? We thought Israel was the good guys. Why not, why not buy matzah? For, oh, never mind. <laughs> so we need to keep doing those things. It feels hopeless. It feels terrible. But so what else is new about the world? And you connect with Palestinians, and you learn about what it means not to give up when it seems <coughs> darkest. These people are tough. They are stubborn. They are smart. And they are not, and they are hurting, and they are not giving up. So whenever I'm starting to feel like, oh, gee, I just remember, I just remember them. I think about them. You'll hear about that in the next couple of lectures. And you'll read about it in Mondo Weiss mm -hmm. and with the UCC pin thing. You'll hear those voices, and they're very, very inspiring. Um, they're, they're, they're very inspiring. And it, you know, it, it, it's, yeah. It's changed, though, over the last 10, since we started going to Palestine. It wasn't in the news. No, that's definitely changed. It's, you know, yeah. the, the work of doing conferences over the country it's, you know, that people have done, they've raised the issue, and young Jewish people are not liking what they're seeing. Israel is doing, and, and Christians are beginning to know. It's, it's yes. In the news, it's in the yeah, media. I mean, pe pe a, a, a Dem Democrats, a, a close to a minority, of, uh, about 43% of Democrats mm -hmm. are not so uh, bullish on Israel anymore. Young people in particular, if they care at all, understand what's going on. Um, and the, the, the black churches, are, we've been working hard on getting them involved, and, and, and they're very keen. And just in terms of that, in terms of our own experience, I mean, I think on the one hand, Martin Luther King Jr., who talked about the arc of history, is long, but it bends toward justice. And I think about Malcolm X, who said, um, yeah, nonviolence is a nice thing, but, um, you know, you got to fight, you got to fight. And um, I don't talk about nonviolence or preach nonviolence when I'm talking about Palestine, because it's not my struggle. And I don't get to tell them how their how their resistance should work. But they they set me real straight on that early on. <laughs> yeah. James Goodson. Yes. Hi, uh, my name's Eldon Potter. Are you an Oregon person? Do you live here in Oregon? Yeah, I live. I live oh, right, I didn't, I I didn't live catch right that part of your bio on that. I, I heard right. Pennsylvania. So. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Philly. Yeah, yeah. All right. But I, I live right across the river in uh, in Northwest. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm just kind of following up on some things you've said, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's a question or if I'm going to restate it in a way and have you kind of respond. But um, how do you feel like, do you, are you okay with kind of no more Israel as a geopolitical nation in our world? I mean, is... You know, you've said, well, I can't remember, you know, it has to, it's going to unravel and it has to kind of thing. Um, how does the end, uh, how does, like, Israel's right to exist, and maybe the right is not the right world? I, I, I hope, I'm trying to ask a question here. You know, what, what, what will happen when, when, the, when the history plays out without any intervention and Israel's uh, existential uh, arc changes or ends or, you know, what will that mean both for the world for Jews around the world, and I guess for, I mean, you could speak to that for you, but um, yeah, I, I guess I'm wondering kind of, is it, is, it in, is it there a reason why Israel should be still a concept in our world that we support and, and make sure happens in the face of worldwide anti-Semitism? That would that would have it go away, so we don't have to deal with that again. It's a, it, 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 you're asking a couple Thank of questions. You. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> these there. are good questions. Okay, so first of all, the whole business about Israel having a right to exist. The mic up. The whole business about that you're saying Israel doesn't have a right to. And you know, you, people say that they say, well, you're saying Israel doesn't have a right to exist. <clears throat> states don't have rights. Right. Right. People have rights, and states are responsible for safeguarding the rights of their citizens. Okay, Israel is failing in that. 
Um, so when people pull that out, what they're saying to you again is, um, I'm not going to say it's your face, but it's, it sounds kind of anti-Semitic to me. Why should the Jews not be, have, a, you know? So <clears throat> if you're asking me what's going to happen and how it's going to happen, I don't know, and it's a fool who will make predictions. Um, but we are finally realizing that the whole two-state thing was a trick. And what we have now is what was always intended, which is one state, and it's an apartheid state. Okay? The, the 1967 war and the changing of those borders, et cetera, et cetera, it was just, uh, uh, that was always coming when the opportunity presented itself. So the plan has always been to have the whole territory and to figure out some way to do with the inconvenient reality that we couldn't get rid of all of the Arabs in 1948, which was the plan, and it was carried out. They just didn't do it. They just couldn't get rid of all of them. They got rid of 80% of the people who, in what was it, the 1948 borders or whatever. So we're finally done with the two-state delusion. And people are talking about one state. That's good, because what we have is one state. The question is, what kind of state? So nobody's questioning whether or not there's going to be an Israel. But can it be one democratic state for all its citizens? If there were to be, if we acknowledge that it's one state right now, if you include Gaza and the West Bank, then the Jews are about 49%. If it's going to be a democracy, then it has to fundamentally change in terms of its laws. It's got to have a constitution, which it does not. The closest thing it has is the Jewish agency, which officially will sell land to Jews, and Arabs are second-class citizens, even though they are, quote, citizens. So <clears throat> what I envision and what I pray for and what I see may be in the offing, because now the alternative has been destroyed, is one democratic state. I don't care what it's called. I want it to be a safe place for the Jews who live there and who have built a wonderful society, except that it's very sick and troubled right now. And for it to be a place, I mean, it's, the Jewish culture there is, in, is amazing. It's incredible. We brought back the Hebrew language. I love that language. I was raised in that language. Um, but it's a two-tiered society. And that's just not OK. So the closest analogy that I can come to is South Africa, OK? The world said no to apartheid in South Africa. It did not say no to South Africa. It did not hate the South African people and tell the Afrikaners and the, and the English who were living there that they didn't have the right to exist, that they had to leave and give it back to the Africans. Nobody said that. And that would be wrong. So the Jews that live in Israel now are home. They deserve a decent place to live and to raise their children. And by the way, the ones that are leaving, are, that can leave, are leaving. They don't want to raise their kids it's there. So my dream, and, and I'll tell you, if the Jews and the Palestinians really had the opportunity to build a society together, watch out. It would be the wonder of the world. We are very, very close. And it, it can work. And when you, I mean, in 67, between 67 when the, that border was destroyed, was gone, before they built the wall, and there was free flow between the West Bank and Israel, it was wonderful. Israelis streamed to the West Bank, and they loved it. Palestinians streamed into Israel, which was socioeconomically about three levels up, and started to work in skilled professions, not as laborers. The settler movement, which was driven by fundamentalists and nationalists, and who, who and the government that didn't have the wherewithal to stop them, ruined all that. Before you knew it, you had an intifada in, in 1989, and before because the Palestinians realized this is not a peaceful occupation. They're stealing our land. They're here to get rid of us and to steal from us. And they built that obscene wall, which, by the way, is not to keep quote terrorists out. It's to steal land and to give a message to the people on the west side of the wall, the Jews, that it's dangerous over there and we're going to protect you from these, from these savages who want to kill you. That's what that wall does. It steals land and it gives a message 
to the Jews to stay inside, don't see what's going on, we'll protect you. So when that wall comes down, again, and the politics can change, give me one generation or less and it will be fine. If, when, how, bloody, not bloody, I don't know. But there's no way, that what has to happen is that Zionism has to go away. That has to be over. Zionism is racist, it's a relic, it's colonial. Nothing like that is accepted in the world that promoted by any other country. You're not allowed to go and settle your own people on other people's land. You're not allowed to take land. If the Chinese do it, they sort of get shit for it, but maybe not so much as long as they're good trading partners. <laughs> but at least we make noises about it. The Zionists, Israel's allowed to get away with that. So I, I think it can be called Israel. I think it would be fine. I think the Muslims and the Christians will be fine with that. I don't, they probably wouldn't care. They would be happy for there to be in Israel as long as they get to play. As long as their land is not taken away. And the Palestinians who lost their homes and lost their farms in, in 48 and in 67, they should get to go home. If there's still a home for them. And if not, they need to be compensated. And there are people in Israel who are working for this. Some of them aren't living in Israel anymore. <laughs> They're not welcome. But they are working for it because they love their country. They'd like to save, they'd like to save it. So I, I, I have a dream. Yeah. And as we know, the dreams take a while, and they don't all get taken care of right away. Yeah. But I, I do have a dream. Yeah. OK, I guess this is a really big question that probably nobody here has the answer to. but. What do you see as being the real hope of humanity? I'm not the historian here, Tracy is. But when I look at all the ways that human beings over the course of history, as I understand it, have continued to do the kind of things that's happening in Israel and Palestine, sometimes I wonder, particularly with the climate crisis being what it is, whether there's any hope for us to pull it together and get our shit together in time to save the planet as a place that's habitable for anybody, anywhere. So I, I think of myself as being an optimistic person, but I don't feel very optimistic right now. Neither do I. I, I think... Uh, I mean, we can, we can attack problems like this yes. and do what we can in our own little sphere of influence on whatever piece of the problem we choose to attack. But I guess when I step way, 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 way back and look at the big, big, big picture, it doesn't look very great to me. No, it's not great. The carbon that's in the atmosphere now is, is doing what it's doing, and it's going to do what it's doing, and it's too late to stop it. So we are headed for... Um, uh, whatever it is we're headed for, and we don't know, okay? we can't predict it, but it's here, and you just read the news, and you know, the Mississippi is like, now, whatever. So, uh, yeah, um, so there is that. I mean, you sound like my son, who says to me, Dad, who, who, by the way, my wife and I are moving up to a farm with our son and his husband, who are now farming the land, it's restorative agriculture, and they're, we're doing what we can in a little corner to say that we are somehow responding to what's happening. So my wife, who will turn 80, I just turned 75, and we're moving again, and we're going to be farming with our son, and we're the farmhands. But it's wonderful. It's kind of a miracle. Yeah. And he says, what are you worried about Palestine? And I said, well, why are you working for queer rights? You know, you do what you can. Yeah. You've got your cause. Um, and, and that's all we can do. But, you know, he wakes up. I mean, this, this kid, he was he's 40. He was close to 40 now. He... He was born knowing that the end of the world was coming. He's one of those kids. And he wakes up in tears in the middle of the night sometimes. Wow. He doesn't have, he just doesn't have a, he doesn't have skin to protect him. Mm -hmm. So we follow him, we always have. And um, he's been, 
he's been a climate activist and a climate realist for a long for a while now. I think my first thought about that happened when I saw the um, the documentary about the p volcanoes on the Pacific Rim, and I started. It was back when you know we were saving the whales and all that stuff, and I came out of there thinking. You know, we've got it all backwards. We need to be talking about how do we save this place so that humans can continue to exist on this planet? Um, not, well, I mean, I the mean, whales, we're, may, we're, we may lose the whales. We're extinguishing or them, and we're on the path to extinguishing ourselves. Pretty soon, exactly. you won't be able to live in India. So, how or is Southeast it? Asia. Where are those people going to go? Right. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> But I think, I don't know, maybe to answer my own question, the hope is to do what we can, what little bit we can in wherever we are in our, with our particular gifts and skills wherever we live on the planet. Amen. So, sorry yeah. about that. My, I promised my wife, I thought, she said, when are you going to be home? I said, maybe by 12.30. So, yeah. On that note, no, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, look, let's get back to Jesus for a minute, Okay. I mean, he had he collected twelve people and to fight the Roman Empire, <laughs> right? And he said, you know, and we're going to keep shouting. And if you try to shut us down, the rocks are going to shout out. Now the rocks are shouting out, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Even yes. the stones. Following Jesus is no easy thing, and I think that's why I get so upset with the Christian community that is so into personal salvation. Yeah. You know, because it's like. No. Christian Zionism. We didn't talk about it. Uh, Christian Zionism. Yes, that too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for you your conversation here and your sermon this morning. It was great. It is a great church. Yes, it is a great church. We try. I can feel it. It's a healing place. We believe in two, two state solutions. Oh, yeah. They have both scriptures. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>